something related to the students of your university, uh, how they can be a part of this program or link their specialization in wildlife science and uh, help the wildlife science or agro science, agriculture science or forestry science, whatever stream they are studying, uh, we can actually work together. Actually, uh, everybody can contribute and everybody can benefit from the wildlife science actually. So I'm really very thankful to uh, Central University of Agriculture, IMPA, for this, inviting me for this webinar. I uh, directly go to the, my talk. And I actually arranged my talk in such a way that I'll be taking the all of you a tour to entire country. So we'll be visiting the different parts of the country. We'll be talking something about what's special about that area with respect to wildlife. But the story which I built now, it's largely based on this strong science actually, but I'm not going to talk about very intensive science in this particular talk because it would be very boring for you because you are from the different team. Uh, but whatever the story I'm going to talk, all actually largely built by the research which our scientists who have worked in this country for last, I can say about six to seven decades actually. So I compiled everything. So I'll be talking that. And again, this is the topic of climate change. Uh, climate change, you know, it is a reality and uh, all of us are facing the problem whether it is in a agriculture or a forestry or a horticulture or coming to the wildlife habitat. Everywhere the problems are there. Uh, but climate change is not the only problem we are facing it. We have uh, too many other problems and then climate change became an additional problem for us. So I'll be touching those topics also in depth, how wildlife getting affected by the climate change, how the government of India are trying to do or even the global community trying to do that. So now I'm going to share my uh, slides. Yes. Yeah. I hope all of you could see. Okay. So if you look at this particular uh, uh, thing, that animal, uh, some of you may be aware of this animal, many may not be even knowing that. Uh, this is a sea cow, it's a dugong. We can commonly call them as a dugong or a sea cow because cow you know, all agriculture, everybody knows about a cow. Uh, cow feed on the grasses, but the sea cow feed on the grasses under the water, that's why it's called a sea cow because this is a dugong, the only herbivore mammal we have it in our country. Uh, this dugong actually has a very interesting story, uh, but I will start with the, that particular story. Uh, then we will be talking more about dugong at a later part of my presentation. The dugong, if you go to uh, Dwarka, that is the extreme west part of it, because you are in the Northeast and you can travel across the country and then end up with the Western coast, that is, you will actually reach the Gujarat coast. If we go to the Gujarat coast, there is a one famous place called a Dwarka. It is very famous for a Hindu religious people because there is a temple called a Lord Krishna temple is there. That is called a Dwarka temple. Uh, the story says that uh, the Dwarka was once ruled by Lord Krishna. That is a kingdom of Lord Krishna. And uh, Lord Krishna normally get into some trouble. Very often he get into trouble. Once he got into trouble, then he was cursed that one day his kingdom will be drowned under the water. So that day has come, the entire kingdom going to be drowned under the sea. And uh, the people of that Dwarka approached Lord Krishna and prayed to him, uh, Krishna, we haven't done any mistake. You did mistake, you are deserved to be punished, but why should we punish? Then Krishna replied to them saying that, you see, whether king makes mistake or a people make mistake, both are same. And both should be punished for any one of their mistake. So since I made a mistake and you are also equally sharing my curse and you will be punished for that, I can't help it. So our kingdom will be drowned. Then you know all of you, the Lord Krishna loves cow. So he is a grace here actually. So the, all the cows gathered and then approached Lord Krishna. 
uh, and prayed him saying that, okay, you made a mistake and you deserve to be punished. And similarly, your people also uh, may be punished because the king cursed. But what mistake we committed or what crime we committed, we should be punished because of your mistake. Then Krishna given them power saying that because he loves cow. So he given a power saying that, okay, uh, you will not be punished. Even my kingdom goes under the water, still you will be surviving. So people say that those cow became a sea cow. That's what the story uh, starts. Uh, uh, in the Dugong conservation in our country. But Dugong occurs in Gujarat, Tamil Nadu. If you go to the Tamil Nadu, there's a place called Rameshwaram. Many may be knowing it, Rameshwaram. That's called the Gulf of Mannar. That is the southern part of our east coast. That sea is called the Gulf of Mannar. The Gulf of Mannar, Mannar means a Lord Krishna, actually. So again, it's a Gulf of Lord Krishna where Dugongs are there. But we do have a dugong in Andaman Nicobar Island. But if you look at the global distribution, the most of the dugongs occurs in Australia and uh, Pacific seas, actually. Uh, but anyway, I'll come back to this particular story uh, with a scientific fact at later stage, whether it is a myth or a, is there any meaning behind that? That's interesting. So why I, want, why I told this particular story is uh, India, uh, we Indians actually uh, proud that uh, we are unique. We are known. We taught a lot of culture, a uh, lot of teachings to the humankind in the world, how to live, in a, how to actually live in a peace, how to live in a hygienic, whatever. A lot of things we taught, including a yoga. Similarly, Indian wildlife is also unique. We had a wonderful wildlife. That's what I'm going to talk one by one. If you look at this particular uh, map, uh, you may be wondering that uh, even for an agro ecosystem, uh, the agriculture graphs in India, it's a differ from the agriculture graphs in Europe. You know very well, because the Europe environment is that uh, the climate factor is different from the Indian climate factor. Uh, similarly, if you go to Africa or you go to North America or South America or in Australia, so we have a different kind of agriculture graphs and certain graph are actually dominating in that particular area. Similarly for a forest, the different kinds of forest occurs in the different parts of the world. But all these things, all the uh, distribution of whether in agriculture or a forest or any other life, is all largely dependent upon the, the local climatic factors or the environment which is prevailing. So what we did it, that the entire global uh, wildlife or a biodiversity, they were classified into six to seven actually realms, we call them based on the things. We Indians are actually belongs to the region called the Oriental realms, where it was called unique region. So what is this Oriental realms where we are living in? Because this particular Oriental region, we have a unique biodiversity, which is different from the Ethiopian, that is a uh, African elements. Are you coming to the Neotic or Neotropical, that is the American element, or going to the Russian region, we call them as a Paleoctic region, are you coming to the Australian regions? But Indian region, that is the Oriental, has a somewhat similarity to the Palearctic region elements with respect to even agriculture crops also. I'll be talking that in the after some time. India, India, as I told you, if you visit uh, New Delhi, I, I think some all of you are far away from New Delhi, but some of you might have traveled to your university study there because I've been there in Anachal. I did a project research program in Anachal Pradesh and other parts of Northeast. I know how difficult it to reach that place. If we coming to the Delhi, you know, Delhi means it's a highly crowded area in which in the center of the Delhi, there is a lake in the lake called Okla. And that particular lake attracts several thousands of birds. That is of India, actually. India has too many people, but at the same time, uh, wildlife also is unique and wonderful here. Because the reason is Indians are known for respecting the nature traditionally. Because of that particular tradition, we have been actually conserving our wildlife, whether directly or indirectly or knowingly or unknowingly. So that's what we always say that India has a deep rooted ethos for nature and wildlife conservation. 
And many of you may be aware that India is one of the 17 mega biodiverse country. If you take it in the globally, uh, there are mega biodiversity country they identified. India actually in the, within the 10 rank, which is one of the big rich biodiversity country, not only the people, even the biodiversity we have very good. And also India has a poor biodiversity hotspot. Hotspots means that, that is the very richest biodiversity areas in the world. That's called a biodiversity hotspot. And in fact, you are actually sitting in one of the biodiversity hotspots of the country. So we have our spot, Western Cards, Western Himalaya, that is the Northeast where you are there. And then our Nicobar Island. These are the four hotspots uh, we have it. Uh, and then if you look at that, we could actually protect our wildlife because in, in India, about a 20 percentage of the area, we actually protected and are conserving it. As I told you, India is one of the mega biodiversity country, but there is something interesting for you, all of you, because India is also one of the nine wave living center of origin and diversity of crop plants. I'm sure your faculty might have told you what is the meaning of wave living centers. So you know the mango, for example. Uh, India is famous for mango. We have, I don't know how many varieties, uh, probably several hundreds of varieties of mango we have it. Similarly, if you go to southern part of our country, where you'll get several hundreds of bananas we have it, or then several varieties of rice we have it. It's all origin, it's originated from Indian landscape, but it, uh, it reached all over the world. India actually supplied food to the entire world by actually responsible of producing these particular wild varieties. It actually, this agriculture crops are actually originated from India. Not only the plant, even animal, those who are working on studying the poultry, animal husbandry, you'd be very surprised to see that anybody in the world who eating a chicken uh, should thank to India because all the chicken, the origin of all the domestic chicken in the world is actually from the red jungle fowl of our northern part of our country. We have a wild bird, it's called a red jungle fowl. This red jungle fowl is re responsible for, from there only that, for a particular gene only, the entire domestic chickens were evolved. You, we have several thousands of uh, varieties of domestic chicken all over the world, and all the things are actually originated from the red jungle fowl. That is called a species. And they similarly, buffalo. Anybody eat or anybody eat a pani, for example, any kind of a dairy product this comes from the buffalo, whether it's a meat or a milk or a paneer, whatever you can say, entire things, again, people must thank India because the origin of all the buffalo in the world actually from the, the Asiatic water white buffalo from the central Indian parts of our country. Okay, so India actually contributed a lot to the world. We should be very proud of that. And that uh, we have been, uh, we are not taking anything written from the people of the world, actually. We given a lot. So one of the Wavelian Center and also many more species, we may be having it, that the entire global community must be getting benefited out of that, but we don't know. But whatever we know right now that, yes, India contributed a lot with respect to diversity of crop plants uh, concern. Then coming to the wildlife concern, India is again another unique thing. Some of you maybe know Aina, or you might have heard the term called a wild goat, wolf, you must have heard, or Hula Kippen. Hula Kippen is there in very close to you in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, if you go to hockey, uh, Tiger Reserve and Dati area, we can find that. That is in the Northeastern species, we have it. Hula Kippen, and the elephant, for example. If the Aina is actually not belongs to India at all. You can see this particular picture, uh, this Aina, which is not from India at all. It is African species. Then we have a species like wolf. Again, it is not from India. It is actually European species. Then we have hula kippen and elephant. Actually, it came from Southeast Asian part of the country. Then you may be wondering that how it happened. Why, how these animals came to India? So a very interesting story. If you look right into the evolution, if this is what once upon time, that is about the 237 million years ago, I'm talking about before the dinosaur actually originated. 
what's happened that people say that there used to be a India, if you look at that India somewhere here, it is actually sandwiched between Africa and Antarctica. I've been there in Antarctica. I'll be talking about Antarctica uh, after some time. But India was actually a sandwich between Africa and Antarctica because of the continental trip and the rotation of the sparse rotation of the air. Then India started splitting away from that particular uh, Gondavana. You know the Gondavana Express, a train is there. It's named after this particular uh, one continent, Gondavana continent. It's actually separated from the Gondavana. It started moving. And then later it came and joined into this particular area that now we call the Asia Asia region. When the India came and then they joined, what's happened that time? There was no Himalaya actually. That's what the movement is still continuing. That's why uh, Himalaya is earthquake prone region because it's the plateau is keep on moving and uh, that's, uh, that's the reason, vulnerable region actually as for the earthquake concern. When India started uh, joining with the Himalaya, means no Himalaya in the Asiatic region, then whatever species actually occurs in the Russia and the China, they started or even Europe, they started moving, actually Indian elements going to Europe, Europe elements coming to India, our Southeast Asian elements are coming to India and going back like that because there was no barrier. Later on the Himalaya formed. Once the Himalaya formed, it became a barrier. Then whatever animal uh, stayed in the Indian landscape or Indian subcontinent, it got trapped there, then it became a, some of them become endemic, some of them, uh, it occurs in other parts of it. That is the reason people always say that why India has all kind of element, whether it is from the Africa or Europe or Southeast Asia. The reason some people say that that is because of the evolutionary history India had it. Now, if you look at the another story, why India has a very rich biodiversity. Uh, I am sure that uh, if you start my moving from Kanyakumari, I'm very close to Kanyakumari, my native place in Pondicherry. So when you move from uh, Southern part of our country from that is the Kanyakumari, and then going towards Kashmir or coming from your part of the country to coming to the Rajasthan area, Gujarat. And you can see the variation in the people language. Every 400 or 500 kilometer distance, people speak in a different language or a different dialect. And their dressings are different. Their food habits are different. The reason is uh, that is the weather condition, the climate factors occurs in that area is a different. So somebody, uh, uh, for example, if you move towards the southern part of our country. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Could you hear me? Hello, sir. Yes. Could you hear me? Hello. Hello. Could you hear me? Hello, Dr. Dr. Shivani, could you hear me? Hello? Hello? Could you hear me? Anybody can reply. Anyone? Could you hear me? Hello? Could you hear me, Mr. Pangaj? Okay, okay, okay. Because I'm not getting any reply. Somebody interrupted that way. Okay, I'm going ahead. So this is what India, you can see this particular map. Uh, this map is actually prepared by Wildlife Institute of India. We call them as a biogeography classification. Uh, and there is the entire country was divided into 10 biogeography zone. Uh, I'll be going from one biogeography zone to another biogeography zone because these biogeography zones actually uh, classified based on the climatic factors, environmental factors, and most importantly, the composition of the biodiversity, forest ecosystem, 
agriculture system and then other biodiversity of that region. So I will start from the Himalayas, that's a trans Himalaya. Uh, the trans Himalaya, if you go to the Ladakh region, you know Ladakh is now recently become a union territory of our country. Or if you go to the, uh, the northern part of our Sikkim, where you can have a feeling of a uh, trans Himalaya, including in Arunachal. In fact, if you go to the uh, border with the China area, some of the portion you can get into the uh, trans Himalaya region where that most of the areas are lower monsoon, very less rainfall and then you'll get a snow-covered mountain. That's the Trans-Himalaya landscape you have in. When you go to the Ladakh, it is very cold a region. Most part of that region is uh, above 3,000 meter uh, mean sea level, where we can see the wonderful animal such as snow leopard. Snow leopard is the major animal, like a tiger. Everybody talks about Indian wildlife who always refer the tiger in the country. Similarly, in a trans Himalayan region, the snow leopard, they play actually act like a role like a tiger in other parts of our country, where you can also see some of the other interesting animal in that region. It's called a wild ass. Uh, you know that a wild ass, the kyang, we call them as, this is the kyang, occurs in the trans Himalaya. The trans Himalaya, you don't find a, a very good vegetation, vegetation there but very less green in a trans Himalaya than largely because of very low rainfall in that region. It's mostly covered with a snow. And then this region, so one can see so one of the wonderful wildlife, whether it's a pearl, a blue sheep, Himalayan or ibex or kyang, there are wonderful. If you go to that, if you, are make, if you want, really want to have a feeling of a Himalaya, or you want to have a good trekking, then you can actually visit into Trans Himalaya, whether it's a Lagul Spiti in Himachal Pradesh or Ladakh in Daman, uh, the region, or if you go to that Sikkim, or you can go to the Dibang uh, region, the Yabo, uh, northern part of the Dibang in Arunachal Pradesh, where you can have such a, a feeling that. Then, if you come down from the Trans Himalaya, and then there is a, another biogeography zones, which we call them as a Himalaya. Himalaya is another beautiful landscape of our country where it looks beautiful, where we get a, a moderate rainfall. It's not like a trans Himalaya where we have a low rainfall, but in a Himalaya that is the below the trans Himalayan region where we will get a moderate rainfall. Because of that, we have a very good vegetation in that particular regions. And then it also accommodates like very unique wildlife there. One of the wildlife which we always amazed was the birds, especially the peasants, beautiful birds. Like uh, you can see, like a peacock. Peacock is a peasant, actually. Like a, a Western trochophon, uh, Kali's peasants. There are a lot of good, beautiful looking birds which occurs in the Himalayan region. You can also see this particular animal. Uh, I don't know anybody could recognize this. This is a musk deer. This is the animal is a unique to Himalayan region. It occurs only in Himalaya. It's endemic to Himalayan landscape. This musk deer, you know, very popular. This animal not doing very well in the wild condition. Their numbers are very few because people push this animal to extract the musk gland, which it has. Because musk, you know, world famous perfume. They can produce from the musk. So because uh, to collect those small gland, uh, people used to kill this animal and then government, various government, whether it is in you know, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim, or Daman Kashmir, Ladakh, they are actually trying their level best to, to protect the habitat of this musk deer. And uh, this region, you can see this Himalayan landscape, beautiful snow covered mountains to excellent green coney, press forest, you know, the forest pine trees, all those beautiful forests, you can uh, see that. Uh, these are the animals, whether it is a musk deer, which I already told you. Then good population of uh, leopard, we have it there. Then you can see that panda, uh, which is there in the Sikkim and the northern part of West Bengal. We have that uh, martin, Himalayan yellow throat and martin. Then we have a blue sheep, Himalayan tar. All these animals occurs in the Himalayan region. But Himalaya is not only that uh, large mammals, because when you talk about Himalaya, everybody talk about Himalaya because Himalaya gives a lot of water to the 
almost uh, 30 percentage of the human being in the Indian subcontinent. Actually, very interesting. The 30 percentage of the population of the Indian subcontinent dependent on the water sources of the Himalaya. So Himalaya has a lot of streams, but when you talk about the beautiful streams, that stream also having a wonderful wildlife. But many times we don't talk about it because some of you may be doing a fishery science. That is also the agriculture, one of the very important subject in the agriculture science. So the fishery science in the fish, which we have it in our Himalayan region. So one of the fish is the magashe, golden magashe. We have it in, even in Arunachal Pradesh, we have a magashe there. We call them a chocolate magashe. So these are the magashe species, they migrate. They live in a big river. When the monsoon starts, then they start moving upwards to the Himalaya. They go to the small streams. Actually, they breed there, they spawn there. Once they're breeding over, they come with the young ones, then come to the mainstream of the river. There they grow. This is what the migrate. This is a very interesting animal. We have it in a Himalayan water. It's endemic to Himalayan rivers. And also we have other Himalayan species. There are large number of cold water fishes. We have it in our Himalayan regions. So this magister is also liked by many anglers. You know angling? The people go for fishing using the hook and rod, line and rod. Okay, it's a very famous sports uh, in the world. And then many anglers from the abroad, uh, they come to India to go for angling of golden mangshir or a trout, especially in uh, Sikkim, West Bengal, uh, then Arunachal Pradesh, uh, uh, Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, Ladakh. Ladakh, we banned fishing there, but other parts of the country, people come there. But what's happening here in India, Indian system, you know, Himalaya is uh, most vulnerable to damage. Uh, when we temperature increases, the species in Himalaya now started moving up because these most of the species are, are they don't tolerate the high temperature. So they're moving up, including your fishes. But how far they can move up? There is a limit for that. When they're moving up, then they cannot move further. So there will be a habitat freeze or a habitat squeeze, we call them. That is happening in Indian uh, streams, Indian Himalayan streams with respect to fish movement concern because of the climate change. We done a, a last 10 year study uh, to study the impact of climate change on the fishes of Himalaya, because as I told you, Himalaya is one of the most vulnerable landscape for climate change. The glaciers are melting very faster rate and the, we are losing the stream water very faster rate. And then these fishes, which we have about 240 species of cold water fishes in Himalaya, now started moving up because they're unable to bear the temperature at the downstream, but they can't move up on that way up on. There is a limit. So we don't know what will happen to these fishes because we know if we don't take any precaution measure, then we are going to lose a huge number of species, Himalayan species because of the climate change. But that is one climate change. But what we do now, you can see this particular picture. This is a stream. Those coming from the Himalayas, this is one of their stream in, uh, Uttarakhand, I call the Alaknanda River. So it comes from the very famous uh, Badrinath, that region. When the river flows, what's happened? Not only here, even in Arunachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, many parts of the Himalaya, we put a dam. This is called hydro projects, actually. We stopped uh, water, we started storing the water or diverting the water to generate electricity. You know, it's very important for India. We, have, we need a more electric energy. We need a more hydropower so that uh, we can uplift the economic of our country. It's very important. I, and, uh, I agree for that, but not, not at the cost of environment. We have to be very, very careful. We have to actually balance the environment with the wildlife conservation. That's what we are telling. But here you can see, because of this barrage, there is no water in the downstream. This is the river. This entire part of the river is now drained up. Assuming that if the fishes are occurs in the region, they want to move, they want to go to the upstream, how can they go? Because there is not even a water in the stream. So this is the additional burden. Already we are noticing the problem because of the climate change, but the human made another problems are actually putting more problem for a fishes in the Himalaya. So this is what happening in the Himalayan regions. Then we can move away because it's a cold area. Himalaya means everybody feel low temperature. From the low temperature to the high temperature region of our country, when you move towards the Rajasthan, bordering with the Pakistan, 
or even uh, other parts of the Gujarat bordering with the Pakistan. That is the region where we have a, a hot desert, that's a thaw desert we have it. And very interestingly, there also we have wild ass. So we have a two species of wild asses in our country. One occurs in the cold desert in Ladakh, another species occurs in the hot desert of our country, that is in a Thar desert region or a Rana Kutch region in a Gujarat region. So that is another interesting landscape. Everybody knows that, again, desert means low rainfall, hot, not much vegetation. Yes, not much vegetation, but doesn't mean that nothing there. You can see this landscape, the desert region, full of sand, very less vegetation, but still a lot of wonderful wildlife present in that particular desert also. One should not forget about that. That is what each and every inches of the country is very important and accommodative to the wildlife, actually, including your agro ecosystem where millions of wild animals, insects, and my colleague must have spoken yesterday, how that insects are actually playing a big role in agro ecosystem. But you can see this animal, you know that one famous in the actor, uh, so this is the animal called a black buck, actually. And then you can see the has, then there are a lot of cat species, then we have a jackal. There are many more species occurs in the day, uh, desert region. And one of the important this, uh, species which we right now concentrate is the great Indian bustard. That is the largest land bird of our country. Big bird, which lives in the uh, grassland of the, our country, western part of our country used to occur up to southern part of our country, Andhra Pradesh and all. Now the population really declined. Now we have less than 250 animals occurs in our country. Mostly they are in the semi-arid region of the Western country. So what we are doing it right now, the government of India, uh, with the help of the government of Rajasthan, government of Gujarat and Maharashtra, and also UP, some Madhya Pradesh. These are the four regions where we have a better problem, but the good population there in Rajasthan and Gujarat right now. So we are trying to recover the species. Uh, that is the research team. Uh, my colleague, one of my senior colleague leading this particular program with the help of the Ministry of Panorama and Forest. They're now trying to recover the species. One of the important program they do is captive breeding. Again, captive breeding is something uh, subject of interest to most of you because this is your own subject. So we do captive breeding and uh, we use this captive breeding as a tool for the conservation. What we are doing is, these birds lay the eggs in the wild condition, the grassland, where a lot of other animals like uh, dogs, feral dogs, or uh, domestic dogs, or cat, or even a human being, they go and collect the eggs and eat it or destroy the nest and all those things. The habitat is not good for uh, uh, eggs as well as the chicks. So either egg will be eaten by this animal or chicks will be eaten by them. This is the biggest problem. Uh, sometimes people also do the same thing. So what we do, uh, we are actually collecting the eggs from the wild and incubating the captivity. We are actually uh, throwing the chicks in the captivity condition. Uh, we, the program just now started. We were successful in rearing uh, nine chicks. Now they become an uh, adult more or less. And then we are planning to release this animal, not this particular first generation, probably the second or uh, third generation of the chicks, which is actually hatched from there captive condition will be released into the wild. So likewise, we are planning to recover the population of great Indian buster in our country. And then going to the another very interesting landscape of our country that is called a Western Cards. You know Western Cards, you can see this particular map starting from Kerala to Maharashtra and then ending in the Gujarat actually. This is the Western Cards, very, very beautiful, thick forest ecosystem. In this is a tropical rainforest like Arunachal Pradesh. Arunachal Pradesh also falls under the category of tropical rainforest system. Similarly, in the Western Cards is a tropical rainforest. There the third uh, region where we have a tropical rainforest is the Andaman Nicobar Island. Because wherever we get a good rain, then we can expect a tropical rainforest system, ecosystem. So Western Cards is an excellent lush green forest system, thick forest where you get a wonderful, beautiful wild animal. There's a very good population of elephant we have it in a southern part of the country, especially in the Western courts. Then we have a, another a tar. As I told you, Himalayan tar in Himalayan landscape. Similarly, we have a Nilgiri tar in a Western courts. Then we have this animal. People may think that this is a bison. You know, everybody tells bison, but actually we don't have a bison in our country. This is called a gore. 
the gore actually indian bison you one may say but actually the right way of calling this animal is a gore it looks like a bison it's like a buffalo uh, but it is the relative of a, we can say buffalo but why buffalo also be have it then another interesting monkey you can see this monkey this is called a lion tail macaque this particular macaque is become very rare in western ghats actually say endemic it occurs only in western ghats that to in the southern part of our country sighting this animal is become very very rare and then you can see this a wild dog dole we have a good population uh, but again now the population of the wild dog is uh, declining very fast in our country then moving to the largest portion of our country is called a deccan peninsula the entire southern plateau including the central india this region is not lush green vegetation and not like a desert also it's a mosaic it is a forest which a, a dry deciduous largely deciduous forest dry deciduous forest sometimes uh, rain for a little bit uh, wet deciduous we can say such kind of forest ecosystem we have it it's a mixture of everything it's a mosaic habitat because of this heterogeneity in the habitat what's happening here you can see the landscape how looks the landscape looks that we have a largest population of tiger in this particular uh, biogeography region the reason is heterogeneity in the habitat that's a beauty so heterogeneity in the diversity means the diverse habitat can accommodate the diverse species so we have very good population of tiger very good population of bear that is a sloth bear good population of gaur then you can see this is a very unique deer species uh, that is called a swam deer uh, we have a swam deer not in arunachal pradesh but you have it in assam if we go to the kasiranga you know kasiranga sadly now flooded with uh, flooded very sad many animal dying there because of that that the forest department really uh, on what foot trying to save as many animal as possible and then the, i heard that lot of ngos civil society helping the forest department in this particular crisis so swam deer we have it in uh, kasiranga that is a uh, very close to you actually but we have swam deer in central india if you want to see some they swam deer you have to visit a place called a kana or a satpura these are the region in madhya pradesh we have a population in uttar pradesh also in a dudua tiger reserve or even in uttarakhand we have a small population of swam deer there uh, then another important biogeography regions where again swam deer there that is the gangetic plain as i told you dudua uh, or in uttarakhand where you can see that swam deer in uh, along the ganges and this gangetic plain you know uh, many of you may be aware because the gangetic plain is the most fertile landscape in the world very interestingly well, though it is a very fertile land but most poorest people also the poorest indians also live in this particular landscape we don't know the reason though it's a rich area a rich habitat fertile land but more poor people also live in the gangetic plain i'm talking about bihar and uttar pradesh okay but this region also having a very good population of elephant swam deer tiger and most importantly a rhino and then there is another very interesting animal which i should say that the gangetic dolphin it is a national aquatic animal uh, we have about uh, 2000 gangetic dolphin in our country half of them are uh, they live in a ganges and half of them live in a brahmaputra where you are there and this is the population is a blind animal need our help to conserve but we kill them indirectly we poison their uh, river pollute the river very badly and then in the even in the fishing interface this animal get entangled in the fishing net kill some people kill this animal for uh, extracting oil that oil is used for catching a fish all those th sad things are happening in our country but now come government of india and the government of various state government uttar pradesh uh, bihar assam all these government state governments now started putting a lot of effort under the name of the uh, navami ganga program or uh, we have our own uh, endangered species recovery program by supported by camp authority in the ministry of environment and forest all these efforts are now going on and the species we are trying to recover it a lot of conservation programs are already initiated that then another interesting animal in a gangetic dolphin is gharial we have a three species of crocodile in our country one of the species is the gharial that is endemic to india which occurs in the gangetic plain 
Ganges, indeed, it tributed the population. Again, this speed need a, a species need a lot of conservation attention right now because the population is not good right now. Come back to the other crocodile. So again, uh, there are a lot of efforts are going on to study the species. We have been monitoring the species because the climate change, for example, increasing the temperature, because this animal crocodile, although it is lives in aquatic, but they have, they have to nest on the land only. They nest on the land, I mean, in the bank of the river. And uh, the body, the temperature, the incubation temperature is very, very critical. When any change in the incubation temperature of that uh, eggs, it changes the sex. You know that sex uh, determination actually uh, determined by the temperature. That's why the temperature determines the sex of the reptiles actually. So in the crocodile, what's happened? If we increase the temperature of the environment, then we'll get a more male. If you reduce the temperature, we'll get a more female. So that is in the case of a crocodile. So because of the climate change, what will happen? And that because of the overheating of the nesting uh, surface, we'll get a more number of male than the female. Then once what will happen, there will be skewed sex ratio, then it is not good for the conservation or survival of the species. So imagine how climate actually affecting the survival of the species. When you talk about the gharial, then I told you the three species of gharial. There's a one more crocodile that is a salt water crocodile. We found them in the coastal region. Because anybody talks about Indian wildlife, they largely talks about tiger, elephant, leopard, rhino, buffalo, crocodile, all those things. But very rarely we talk about coastal and marine system, but India too have a excellent, uh, wonderful coastal marine biodiversity. Of course, we have it in a crocodile also. One of the very important uh, marine animal we have it in our country is a seeker. Amazing. In fact, uh, we believe that the 50% of the Hollywood Ridley turtle, a popular, a global population of Hollywood Ridley turtle actually comes and nest in the Indian coast in Varisa. So if you are really interested to see this particular uh, phenomena, it's one of the wonderful natural phenomena. It happens every year in the country and in the month of uh, somewhere in uh, January uh, or February, one has to go to Varisa coast. There is a place called uh, Gairmada where you are seeing it right now, Gairmada beach where thousands of thousands of sea turtle comes and uh, nest there. So when they come for a nesting, it's not that directly they come to the sea. Actually, in the month of November, they come, they gather in the along the Orissa coast. They start gathering, they breeding, they mating, everything they do that. When the turtles are actually started congregating in the month of November and December, that is the time the fish also come. In fact, the fish followed by the sea turtle along the coast. When the fishermen will be waiting for the you know, arrival of fishes in the November and December. So when the fish comes, the fishermen also go because they are waiting for catch fish. They go and catch the fish. When they throw the net, that is the time the turtle also mixed with the fish. The turtles are caught in the net. Actually, what's happened, the turtle, sea turtles are like a human being, like us. We breathe through nose, we breathe through the lungs. Okay, We breathe air, not like a fish. Turtles are not like a fish. They breathe they have a lungs actually. They have to come to the surface to breathe, to take air. But when you spread the fishing net, these animals are drowned under the water. They are not allowed to actually come to the surface to breathe. Because of that, they die. Because they drown, they die. So as to the aspects, and this is the biggest problem we had in Trina, Orissa coast. Then how we solved this problem? The thing is, the coast guard, Marine Police, Orissa Coast Guard, Marine Police, Fisheries Department, Forest Department, all got together and they started protecting this particular sea when the turtles are coming. They could be able to prevent the illegal fishing in this particular region. Because of that, now not many turtles are dying or killed because of this activity. So thanks to this excellent teamwork which happened in the Orissa Coast. You can see the sad pictures of how turtles are drowned there. This is the life cycle. When the turtle hatches on the shore, uh, they go back. Then after 20 to 40 years later, only female, the female come back to the shore to lay it. Male never come back. When you see males on the shore means it definitely it is a dead one, not a live one. So male never come back, but only female comes 
after 20 to 40 years later to lay there. This is a life cycle. They do that. When they come, this is what the problems are there. Now here, very interesting climate factor. When the turtles are actually coming and laying eggs on the beaches, and it is in opposite way. When the, I told you, increase in temperature will have more number of uh, males in crocodile hatching, okay? But in the case of sea turtle, it is an opposite way. If the temperature increase during the incubation period on the means nesting beaches, what will happen? We will get a more female actually. Crocodile will get a more male, but here it will get a more female. So overheating of the beaches, it leads to the more female than less number of male. Again, it's a skewed sex ratio. It is not good for a long-term survival of any wild animals in the world. Okay. So that is what the climate change is actually, how dangerous for the survival of this animal, how they are actually influencing the uh, physiology of the animal, even the sex of the animal determination, very, very dangerous things which are happening. Now I'm telling there are another things. This is the beaches where you, the turtles nest in the Orisakos. I quickly go through it. The beaches are getting into more dynamic nowadays because of the climate change. We don't know the sea become very rough. The beaches are eroding at faster rate. You can see this is the nesting beach. Two of my students are standing on the beach. The beach right now carries, uh, I can say, uh, several lakhs of eggs actually. Imagine two lakhs turtle nested right now. Uh, each turtle can lay 120 eggs. So 120 multiplied by two lakhs, that many eggs are right now on this particular beach. But because of the climate change or some other reason, the sea become a rough, sea uh, shores are unpredictable. They are in a dynamic and the seashores are getting eroded. Because of that, the nests are getting washed. And then finally, we are getting such kind of very uh, sad thing. Though we are, uh, we could protect the sea turtle properly. We allowed them to breed better. We allowed them uh, lay eggs better. We protect their nesting habitat. Again, because of some natural catastrophe, natural phenomena, including the climate change, we don't know exactly the reason. We are unable to uh, save the eggs. So again, thousands of thousands of eggs are washed ashore happening in the country. And then another problem, we have too many problems already. Then another problem is the hydrocarbon. Now the government of India want to explore all its resources from the uh, Indian Sea where sea turtles are getting into clash. So we conducted a lot of study uh, on the movement of sea turtles we studied. Then we helped the hydrocarbon ministry where they should go for oil exploration, where they shouldn't go for oil exploration, where, because when you get the critical habitat of the sea turtle using a satellite tracking study, we given the government that these are the areas are important for sea turtle, please don't touch it. Then other area where you can go for oil exploration. So science helps in the development and the science also helps in the conservation of the wild animal. This is one other example we have it. Then another interesting species, whale shark. The largest fish in the world, actually, living fish. And these whale sharks come to the Indian coast for a breeding. And uh, this is the largest fish, but uh, it won't harm the human being. It won't eat anything. This is actually a herbivore plankton feed, as actually it feeds on the eggs of the fishes or plankton. So, so it won't feed on the bigger, big animal. It's a very lovely animal, big animal, but very, very lovely creature and beautiful animal. And this animal, when they come to breed in India, and our fishermen kill this animal. Uh, they take the fins, they sell the fins because fin has a very export value. They export into the other country because Indians don't eat the meat of the whale shark and also Indians don't eat the fin also. It is only the international market. So the fishermen kill it. And most importantly, the fishermen, Indian fishermen, take out the liver of the whale shark and they extract the oil, that oil they use it for painting their boat. Okay, that is a very important thing, but for the fishermen. But imagine this whale shark population is one of the endangered animals we have it in our country. When they come to breed and these fishermen are killing it. So what government of Gujarat did it, and they promoted a one conservation message saying that, look, in Indian culture or Indian, whether it is a Hindu, Muslim or a Christian, across the religion in India, what we do, when we get marry our daughter, then daughter goes to the in-law's house, when she get conceived, the first pregnant, the daughter come back, return back to the parent's house. 
it is a responsibility of the parents to take care of her daughter and the baby and then send the daughter along with the baby back to the in-laws house this is a responsibility of any good parents in our country any religion doesn't matter so the government of gujarat spread this message saying that whale sharks are our daughter in law they coming to india our coast to give a birth it is our responsibility to send her back with the baby very safely very interesting very very interesting because once upon time gujarat fishermen used to kill this whale shark like anything blindly and now and uh, i can say last 9 years not even a single whale shark was killed in gujarat coast and in fact they are helping the conservation of whale shark this is amazing conservation story we have it in our country there another interesting thing the message spread by the Hin hindu baba in gujarat but the fishermen are muslim community in gujarat coast and they accepted so the religion and all nothing they are doing it the value our tradition is very very important so the fishermen now stopped killing this animal and then any animal get entangled also in the fishing net the fishermen with the help of the uh, ngo like wildlife trust of india it was actually uh, one of my senior colleague professor b c chowdhury actually uh, helping that team led by another my student dr sajan john they are doing an extremely good job in uh, conserving the whale shark even the whale shark getting entangled in the fishing net and the gujarat government giving them a compensation uh, provided they release the whale shark cut their net and release the whale shark they are doing it actually they saved uh, more than 1000 uh, whale shark so far then we go to your own landscape northeast northeast another beautiful and wonderful landscape of our country it is a very lush green like a western ghats and the excellent wildlife we have it very good population of wild buffalo we can found in assam good population of rhino big mihawk hula kippen this is wonderful wildlife in fact if you want to see the the big five of india wildlife one has to go to northeast part of our country such a wonderful place you people are really lucky to be part of the northeast where you are studying and all it's a wonderful habitat i can say with respect to wildlife as well as the forestry we have a another wild clouded leopard lorries civet assamese macaque all these interesting animals we have it in the northeast part where we have a, if we go to the manipur there is a manipur dancing deer in a lokta clek it called the lepur lemcho national park in manipur uh, this particular animal actually living in the floating islands in the lokta clek that's why when the islands are floating someone uh, seeing this them from distant think that the animals are actually a dancing that's why it's called a dancing deer again this dancing deer the manipur manipur antler deer is not doing very well so that's why again the government of india and the government of manipur are uh, putting lot of effort they take lot of initiative to actually conserve the sangai deer and bring back the population now the government of manipur actually working on uh, getting a second home right now it is there in only one lake you are very close to that and i know very difficult to go from there north east traveling is very difficult but if time permits you can visit the lokta clek and see the manipur day you will be very lucky which i haven't seen so far and then islands is my favorite in fact i started my research way back in 1994 from nicobar islands that is my heart i studied the birds in nicobar islands and when you talk about islands you can see such a beautiful place i don't know how many of you actually visited the beaches the moment if we talk about a beach we talk about goa but i can say you tell one thing that goa beaches are the most tedious beaches of our country if you really interested to see the beautiful beaches you have to visit andaman andaman having a wonderful beaches probably the best beaches of asia we have it now you are seeing the picture this is from the havelock island radhanagar beach one of the best beaches of our country where you can roll on that beaches the sand won't touch on you but the sand still look a white in color that is the beauty of the best beaches so it looks beautiful and andaman nicobar there is another turtle when i saw talked about olive ridley which is the smallest sea turtle in the world we have it in orissa coast but when you come to the andaman and nicobar island where you get a largest sea turtle in the world you see that is what india we have everything in indian culture 
Again, the sail turtle comes to under, Andaman Nicobar Island to lay egg. The weight of one turtle is 1,000 kg, one ton actually. They come, lay eggs. Again, the beaches are exposed to environment. You know, again, the climate change because of sea level rise, the nesting beaches are eroding in at faster rate. And we are also now worried about their uh, sexual changes in the population, squid sex ratio. We don't know much data in this, but we worry that uh, the temperature increase in temperature may affecting the population sex. And the place uh, we are worried about the, the nesting habitat. It's all actually uh, getting eroded by the sea level rise. So summarize everything, put all these biogeography zone. I summarize all the problems, but the climate change is one of the issue. We could see it in the most of the biogeography zone, but most importantly, what we found that the climate change is very, very high level in the Himalayan region, island region. This is the things we can talk about, coastal region and islands and Himalaya, sea and mountain. These are the two big biogeography region of our country, more vulnerable to climate than the other biogeography zone. This is the document, even if you are interested, you can go through, I really recommend, all of you read our National Biodiversity Report, the fifth National Biodiversity Report prepared by uh, Ministry of Environment and uh, Pilot Institute of India helped in developing this report and myself, one of the PA of the project. It is available online. It talks about whatever I've spoken right now. So it covers entire wildlife, entire biodiversity of our country. And then the problems. Though we have a lot of wildlife, good, wonderful thing, but the problems also many in our country. One is the poaching. The poaching is rampant in our country. People kill animal, whether it's a land animal or a sea animal, whatever. They kill it. We are greedy people. So illegal trade, poaching is the biggest issue we are facing now. And then over harvesting, even in the fishes, then we are getting into invasive species, you know, weeds. You understand better weeds, exotic species. These weeds, exotic, that invasive alien species, which is not only threatening the aqua ecosystem, it is also threatening the other eco wild ecosystem of our country, whether it's a wetland, forest, whatever ecosystem. Everywhere we have alien species, they're really posing a problem for our country. This is one of the alien species, African catfish. I really appreciate all of you, those who are coming from the fishery science or uh, any animal country, please never promote any exotic species in the name of developing an economy, promoting the uh, agriculture crops, whatever. Never, never try to use exotic species. Try to use our Indian indigenous species uh, so that you can improve your agriculture production and so that we can improve the economic of the people, country. You can improve the livelihood of the people. You can feed the people. Okay, we have to feed. Agriculture science is very, very important science. I know that. Very, very important. Forest is very important. These are the science directly related to the human well-being. We have to feed. You will be feeding the people. But while doing that, don't get into, don't choose the wrong species for feeding the people. One of the thing is our fisheries people always promoted the African catfish. Now African cat become very, very invasive in the Indian water systems. And then pollution. I don't want to talk more about that. All of you have plastic pollution, big problem. Our prime minister always talks about plastic pollution, how the dangerous of the plastic pollution. Government of India trying their level best to minimize the pollution. Many states in our country already banned uh, uh, single-use plastic, but unfortunately, because of coronavirus, and uh, now the plastic again coming back, uh, probably in the short term, once the COVID issue solved, again, people may be stop using the plastic. Uh, so plastic pollution is the problem, then pollution, air pollution is another problem, and then oil exploration, the sea is the problem, then climate change, which have been already touched many occasion, the climate change, the earth getting hotter and hotter, it is actually visible in the diversity because there is a reduction in the diversity. Some of the unwanted species taking advantage of the climate change. For example, most of the exotic species are really doing very well because of the change in the climate. They're very dangerous. The good things are going down and the bad things are taking advantage of this. This is the impact of the climate change which you are facing it nowadays. So ultimately, you see these pictures, the global I think the GDP is keep on increasing when the people and the GDP increases, where it is leads, you can see that the habitat. 
when the economic of the global economic increases the population increases it has a very direct bearing on the natural resources and the natural resources means because we need a food you know you can't eat a computer you can't eat a technology you can't eat a car you can't eat a money asset ultimately man need a food actually we need a rice we need a wheat something na no? eating that is what important but when you do that where will cultivate because we destroyed the landscape for construction of building this that all this urban this that but there is no place to actually cultivate agriculture crop where we are going now we are actually destroying the natural forest to promote agriculture that is not a good practice actually because natural forest has its own economic value it they are the reserve bank of uh, everything we can say but now we are actually these nature resource became a soft target for the development we destroyed the habitat then on that article because when we talk about the climate change we have too many problem as i told you india facing a lot of problem because of climate change but india too have a too many other problem but how can you know that this animal is declining or this forest is degrading just because of climate change how do you know that because one may argue because anything if you talk we have to talk in a scientific way one may argue that how do you are uh, sure that this is happening because of climate change not because of other anthropogenic also to get a answer we are using antarctica ecosystem where anthropogenic pressures are almost nil or very very negligible where the climate impacts are very high so now we are actually studying the behavior and the distribution pattern of the animal there and then relating into the climate change and then matching that experience with the indian condition and then we are understanding the impact of climate change on indian wildlife so we have a program uh, some of you may be interested to work in antarctica you can do uh, all the students can participate some of the research can participate that is the program led by the ministry of earth science there is an institute called a national center for polar uh, polar and ocean research located in uh, goa so wonderful institute this institute organized the expedition they having a research station in antarctica and uh, we have a right now two research station we had a three one gone down and uh, two we have it running institutions and uh, indian scientist go myself visited antarctica now i have a uh, antarctica program is ongoing for last uh, 10 years and uh, my students right now working in that antarctica system so this is the area where you can we have a research station for well, those days we used to travel from goa to antarctica directly by ship it used to be a three months voyage now we stopped it nowadays we what we do we fly up to cape town from cape town we take a ship and then we go to there is a two station one at lossman hills another is maitri maitri is was our old station the lossman hills it's called a barath that is we exactly established recently a few years before and uh, these two stations are a state of art research station our scientists go and do research there uh, what we do this is a three stations you can see there this is a congo three or uh, the first research station of our country when mr sindra gandhi was our prime minister uh, she led this program and uh, the station was established over the ice and uh, because of the again climate change or whatever reason uh, the may ice got melting started melting and then finally our research station gone down under the ice actually let on be established a two important very advanced research station you can see it in the pictures one is lossman hill park station another one is the maitri so beautiful all kind of research facilities are available the students can also try to visit they take two students every year to participate in this particular expedition you can also search uh, for that uh, you have to go by ship this is the ship where we are traveling it uh, you can voyage cruise through the ice when you approaching the southern part of indian ocean that is a very close to antarctica sea uh, you can see beautiful penguin because we have been studying the birds and mammals of antarctica and monitoring them and with reference to the climate change impact actually so we study the population of all the penguins and see and the seals and also other birds like uh, uh, this is a skua of uh, alpatros there are a lot of birds are there in this area we are studying their population what do we do we go by ship we anchor the ship in the ice cave we take helicopter 
uh, because in the many places we can't go by, I think we, we have to go by helicopter only. So we use helicopter to do area survey and monitor the population. And sometimes uh, this is what, when you fly over the things, you can see that uh, tots, these are the seals actually. Uh, you can find it in the Antarctica region. They are on the ice. We count them, we go very close. We monitor their edge structure. Sometimes we take the snow vehicle. We go to their uh, very close to the seal and the birds. We observe their behavior. Uh, this is the seal you can see very close pictures. And also we monitor. One of my students recently did a PhD on uh, snow petrol. He studied the genetics of the snow petrol population and then related to the climate change. And we very interesting, we found that uh, there are some problems already started in Antarctica too because of the climate change, because we could see that in a hatching success of the snow petrol, small snow petrol is a very small, beautiful, cute bird, white in color bird. This bird occurs only in Antarctica. It's endemic to Antarctica, very tiny and cute bird. And uh, their population seems to be better now, but uh, uh, there will be a problem in future if we don't address it. But again, what kind of address we can do in climate change in under? We can't do much. It is a collective effort of the entire global community because if you burn forest in uh, India or Asia or Europe or America, that impact will be actually passed on the Antarctic also. So we have to stop uh, no, uh, whatever uh, problems with, uh, which is responsible for global warming on the uh, land. So it's my students is attacking the birds for behavior. And then these are some of the other important things which the government of India, we are doing it. We choose an about 21 species, very important species, uh, because we can't consider all the species. We have to prioritize the species. What government of India did it, they prioritized about 21 species right now, and they're recovering the population of these 21 species. And one of the species is, uh, I can say, the dugong. Right now I'm leading this uh, dugong program. You can see the sea cow, which I told you the story as it started. Uh, this dugong, is a, they feed only the sea grasses. The flowering plants are under the water. This is the sea grasses, we have it. So we right now, because the population of the dugong right now in, in India is uh, less than 250 individuals. Now the government of India and the state government of Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Andaman, Nicobar Island, actually there were three region only we have at Dugong right now. Uh, we are trying to recover the species. Actually, so the in the Dugong means, as I told you, it's one of the wonderful animal. And this animal now facing a problem because they live on the seagrass beds in the coastal region where people put the net, they catch it. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. But again, like a sea turtle, dugong also like a human being. They breathe through lungs actually. So they have to come to the surface to breathe, yeah. But when you put a net, fishing net, dugong get entangled in the net, they're drowned under the water, then they cannot uh, actually come up and breathe their life. That is a one problem. We are facing the fishing related mortality is very high in our country. And then second problem we have it in Dugong in our country is boat heat. Dugong is not like a shark or a dolphin. They can't swim fast. They are beautiful animal, but they actually float. They swim very slowly. They move very slowly. So when a boat comes fast in their habitat, they get confused and then the boat can hit them, then they kill this animal. And then third important problems we are facing it in our country is people sometimes kill dugong for a meat. Uh, some people think that the dugong meat is one of the most tastiest meat on the earth, actually. Uh, so these people, some people go and they kill, although dugongs are protected species. Anybody kill dugong will be punished for 70 years jail. Okay, this is what uh, is highest protection that dugong is getting in our country. But because of this problem, and there are so many other problems, because when you talk about dugong, when you conserve a dugong, we can conserve all other animals, sea turtle, other fishes, because we know the dugong habitat actually can contribute a huge economic to the fishermen community in the country. I will tell you that story later, how much is that thing. But when you are doing it, the problems are enormous, including a climate change, because the coastal habitat is another most vulnerable habitat due to the climate change in the sea level rise or whatever increase in temperature is not good for uh, 
seagrass beds or a coral reefs in our country. So what we did it, we initiated this program with the help of the three uh, forest department. And then we realized that the importance of Dugang, because this is the only way of conserving a Dugang is creating awareness among the community. And then take the community with us and then uh, protect the Dugang by the community, not by the, any government. This is the tools we use, strategy we followed it. So we approached the uh, fisherman community. We started supporting the education of the fishermen children who are going to the school. We give them a Dugong scholarship. Through these children, we approach the parents, and then the parents are stopped killing this animal. That's a very interesting thing. And another interesting thing we found that one Dugong can contribute two crore rupees worth of fishes every year to the fishermen community. When you protect a Dugong, the contribution, the economic ecosystem service of the one Dugong habitat is two crore rupees. How the dugongs are? Dugongs are actually like a friendly, farmer friendly. They actually clean, manage their seagrass habitat. Seagrass habitat is the habitat of breeding ground of several commercially important fishes. When the dugongs habitat, someone has to maintain so that it is conducive for the fishes to breed there. Who will do this job? Dugong doing it, free of cost. So the fishermen were told that the role of ecological role of the dugong in the system. And they understood now the fishermen has now started protecting the dugong in our country. Another thing, we can promote underwater ecotourism. Uh, one can go and dive under the water and they see beautiful coral. You can see sea grass birds, you can see fishes. You can also see dugong. But now dugong numbers are very few. And my idea is in next 10 years, we get the more number of dugong in our Indian naturally so that people can go and dive and see them and uh, enjoy the beauty of the dugong. So what we do, we do research, a lot of research going on. We monitor the population using a drone technology. We use a satellite tracking technology, all those things. We, our, my students are really working very hard. All of them are divers. Uh, most of them are girls. That is another interesting things that the young girls, the youth in our country coming forward to work in a, such a very harsh climate because working under in the marine ecosystem is not easy task. That too by girls. There are many students of mine are girls they are working really extremely good job. They're doing it and uh, ultimately they're getting a very good result also. So there are uh, photographs, underwater photographs my student takes and identify the individual. And we also do genetic studies. We find out the reason for death of any animal which is standard in the shows. Uh, we do genetic study. And also we realized that there are some other issues, ghost net, when fishermen throw the net and the torn net are fallen on the seagrass bed, when the dugong goes and feed, they're getting entangled in their net. So now my team, with the help of the forest department and coast guard, Indian Navy, marine police, local U, everybody joined to removing these ghost net. That's something is happening. Uh, we are doing as part of the genetic study. I come to the story which I started from the Lord Krishna. What we realize right now that Indian population genetically unique. Now we don't know whether the Dwarka story is really correct or not. What we found right now, uh, we are going to publish this paper. It's already accepted. Very soon it will be coming in a couple of weeks. And uh, this paper says that Indian dugong genes are ancient genes. Probably the dugongs from India migrated, radiated for, towards Australia and Africa and maybe they might have originated from Indian landscape, so which we don't know, but scientific, but again, just as a joke at part, but genetically we found that the Dugong population in India speaks to be unique in nature. We do a lot of awareness program because majority of the conservation program, the key is the awareness. We should bring the people in on board. We should actually say that, uh, convince the people that the conservation means for them, their, for their well-being and our well-being. Once the people understand this, then they will start supporting the conservation. This is what we have been doing it with respect to Dugang. You can see a lot of conservation program, musical, dance, drama, we organize, and we also build a capacity because in the Coast Guard, Navy, in Forest Department, they don't have much effective in managing the marine biodiversity in our country. No, we are Wildlife Institute of India. We are training them how to actually take care of this marine, how to monitor the marine biodiversity in our country. These are the, my kids, the school children. They are our, my Dugang ambassador. 
and their children educations are supported by the government of India using a Dugan scholarship. And these children helps us cleaning the coastal region, convincing the parents don't kill the dugong, all those. They're doing a really miracle job. We got the result. You can see this particular uh, uh, video. There's the end result of the dugong. We can see that. Okay, these are the same fishermen. Once upon a time, used to actually kill the dugong for a meat or for a money. You know, the worth of one dugong is two lakh rupees for a fisherman if they kill it. Uh, it's illegal killing. If they kill, we call them as a poaching. Uh, if they kill, they get two lakh. But these fishermen are very poor fishermen. So telling, convincing them, leave that two lakh rupees in the sea, it's very difficult for them. They are very poor, very, very poor. But now they're doing it. And the many dugongs in the last two years released back by the fishermen voluntarily because they understood the importance of dugong. That's what the another classical example that we can do it. So now I will talk only briefly for five minutes about my institute because being a, you are the graduate and postgraduate student. So you may wondering that how you can actually part, take part in the wildlife research, wildlife science in our country. So Wildlife Institute of India, uh, it's a very uh, not a very very old institute. It is actually uh, started in 1985. Uh, the main objective of the uh, uh, institute aim is to develop the human capacity. I like any other university. We do have a, a to enhance the human resources in wildlife conservation and management in the country, including the research. So we have a lot of departments, and uh, we do have a beautiful campus in our institute. Uh, our flagship program, this is the one program we do uh, top priority, that is the postgraduate degree course in wildlife management. This is only for uh, Indian Forest Service officials uh, from our forest department and abroad. So the officers who are actually working in a forest department or in foreign country who can participate in this particular course is a 10 months course. Second course is the three month certificate course. Again, it is for in-service forest officials who are working in the various forest department. Uh, we organize this course, so even international participants uh, attend this particular course. Then we have a customized so various course. Uh, we have about 40 to 50 courses we organize. These are customized course. Some of the course you may attend also. Some of the course as a student, uh, you can take part uh, uh, in this particular course. You can keep on visiting our web website for announcement of this course. Then important course, maybe you have your brother and sisters are interested because we have master program. Even the BSc forestry student, BS agriculture student, animal husbandry student, fishery student can participate and take uh, admission in the, our uh, two years master degree program. We don't take every year. We take students once in two years. Once the students pass out, the next batch we take it. We take in total 20 students every year. We provide 12 scholarship. Otherwise, it's a paid course. Uh, it is about uh, 10 lakh rupees, but uh, we give a scholarship, 12 students. We'll give them full scholarship, including fellowship to those students. So this is one of the very, very important course, highly rated course. Uh, it is matching with any other international university. Uh, uh, not even a single student so far sitting idly. Everybody occupied, engaged in uh, very good positions. The course is very good. Uh, uh, you, if you are interested, it's all India competitive exam entrance we organize and then followed by interview. If you are selected, then you will be supported with a fellowship in this course. Uh, we have a lot of our strength is a research program. Uh, though we had a lot of program right now, about 80 research programs we are going in. We have about 400 research scholars working with us, and there are 400 PhD students actually right now working in our program. Uh, this is a research is our strength, and uh, we, whatever learning we get it from the research, we actually use it for managing our wildlife and advising the government how to manage the wildlife in our country. Uh, these are some of the things we are keep on doing a protected database management, wildlife instead of doing it. We also evaluate the how our Indian wildlife managements are 
happening in our country, whether we are doing well or bad, or where, what kind of corrective measure we have to do it. So such kind of evaluation we do being a part of the government of India. And also, as I told you, Dugong, we done it, Sangai Day, Great Indian Buster. So we conducted so a lot of research on the endangered flagship species. I myself from the endangered species management department. Uh, so we conduct a lot of research on endangered species and therefore recovery. And we use research science for the recovery and conservation. So that's what we have been helping. We were very successful in uh, uh, tiger conservation in our country. We, uh, we have an excellent team in our institute uh, who organized the All India Tiger Census every four years with the help of the uh, NTC, who is the main coordinator of this program. And uh, we conduct survey, we monitor the tiger population, wherever problem, we try to address the problems in our country. That's the things we are doing it in uh, India, mm -hmm. lions, another species we are focusing a lot. And also we work on Himalayan region with respect to climate change because Himalaya is most vulnerable habitat. We do a lot of work in Albine Meadow on this other landscape we study. We also have a wildlife forensic lab. We have a genetic lab. Uh, we, we have a different streams on wildlife genetics, wildlife forensic. These are the, some of the emerging science subject in our institute and uh, at global level, we are matching with the global level. Any technology which is used by anywhere in the world it is used in our institute right now. So technically wise, uh, technology wise, uh, there is no threat of anything issue in the country. As I told you, Coastal Marine System, this is the program led by myself uh, 10 years before. Uh, we use all kind of technology, whether it's a marine system, coastal or a Limalia land, whatever system, we do that. We produce a lot of documents. Most of our documents are available online. Anybody interested, you can just uh, browse through our website. You'll get a lot of documents available. Whatever research we do, we share with the free of cost. We, we, it is, that is our uh, ideology. We want to share our research information to the public uh, so that they shouldn't have any issue on assessing our resources. We help the government because we, we, know, we know that India is one of the fastest developing country in the world. And the development is very important, but while you do development, we know uh, it is having a, a negative bearing on the wildlife conservation, biodiversity conservation. So how to balance it? That's what the important task that WA has been doing it. So we need development. We should also conserve our wildlife, how to do both. So Wildlife Institute of India expertise in that particular subject. Uh, we are trying our level best to, to balance these two. Yes, it is not possible always that uh, uh, because wildlife conservation sometimes compromised or sometimes development is compromised. We have to compromise when, uh, wherever it is required. And most of the time, we don't want wildlife conservation is on fact seat because our priority goes to biodiversity first and then development second. But at the same time, we should also recognize the importance of development. And uh, we work with uh, various institutions, international institutions. Uh, we do services. We help the government of India to address the various international conventions uh, technically we do. And there are so many ongoing projects, uh, whether it's in Himalaya, we have a courses running, we have a, a campus supported recovery program in Dengisby right now is going on. Uh, and another important work we have in doing is we are working part of the Naomi Ganga program we are trying to help the, this program recover the habitat of Ganga with respect to biodiversity conservation. So our team is already getting an excellent result in this particular program. We are, we are also part of this program. We work, we believe on teamwork actually. Uh, we work with the various international institutions, national institutions in a collaborative mode. We believe on that. In fact, uh, we have a lot of program in Northeast Asia. We would love to actually collaborate with the uh, UR University also. So probably we can talk at later stage about this, but we believe on that teamwork is the one thing where we can achieve a lot of things. So we actually closely working with various institutions, uh, internationally and nationally reputed institution or country. So with this, I'll end my talk. I know it is very long talk. Uh, normally we don't subscribe such kind of long talk. Probably we stop at 20 to 30 minutes only. Uh, but your coordinator, Dr. Shivani, said that it will be a two-hour session. So I prepared accordingly. I hope you enjoyed it. But uh, now I'm really like to take your question. If you have any clarification questions, you can take. Thank you.
I am unable to hear, sir. I think your mics are. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. I'm I... audible, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this elaborate description on climate change and right from the diversity and then from your uh, own expertise on riverine ecosystem, then you think about the scope and opportunities for the students in this field, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, can you enable your uh, screen sharing? So, yeah, just a second, just, I'll stop that. Sir, disable the screen sharing. Yeah, I've done. Yeah. I'll make it uh, now. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir, for your. Thank you, sir. Um, it's, it is, yes. If anybody has any questions, you yeah, can ask. Thank you very much, sir, for your um, talk on wildlife um, aspects, wildlife research in India with the special reference to climate change. And uh, I could see your first slide. Uh, this um, ocean cow, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. very nice. And uh, I think I have done a lot of research on uh, marine. And uh, Dr. Shivani, has, she was a, a secretary, organizing secretary, and a nodal officer for this whole college. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is the fourth day. And fourth day, it was a very amazing one. Like, it's uh, um, you have talked more about on this uh, uh, ocean and many other things, sir. And uh, in between, I could be here and the other official work I have gone. I came back. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, really, thank and uh, take a few more minutes to address all the questions raised by our participants or the students. Basically, horticulture, forestry, and agriculture, um, UG, BG, and PhD. All three groups are there. And this IDP program under NOCAP, it is institutional development program, and more focusing on to develop um, uh, give this uh, uh, like uh, startup and many kind of lectures, talks to improve the overall. Um, it's kind of paradigm shift to the students to expose it to the new kind of knowledge. Uh, even this lockdown period, and uh, we have started. This is the fourth one, sir. And uh, thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and giving your valuable time and delivering this lecture on this uh, wildlife uh, species. Thank you very much, sir. Now I'll give the I'll give back to uh, Shwani work, and she will lead in uh, question and answer session. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me there. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Shwani, your mic is mute. Yes, sir. So it's audible. Yes, now it's up. Now again, it's on mute. Yes. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Okay, sir, I'll start the discussion session, sir. It was uh, first question was asked by Sachin Govindrao Munde, uh, which mitigation and adaptation option towards the wildlife in the climate change, sir. Yes, it's a very which nice question. Mitigation and uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, I. Yeah. I. I. Able to work the wildlife. <laughs> okay, I will answer the both the questions. Uh, uh, starting with the Sachin Skwentrao. Uh, there is no one single solution available. Uh, in fact, uh, we need a different kind of uh, strategy for a different kind of ecosystem uh, to go for a climate adaptation plan. So what we use the strategy is, uh, we are trying to minimize the anthropogenic related threats right now, because that is something we can do it. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example in a uh, Himalayan drift system. What Himalaya we are doing it, uh, we are now identified the uh, several biodiversity hotspots in Himalaya. We want to protect that particular area. That is, hotspots should be uh, protected forever. 
no development, nobody used that resources. So that whatever something left, we can conserve that particular thing. This is what one of the And the second thing is, uh, for example, we know the problems of water and we know the problem people uh, depend on the forest ecosystem going for a resource depletion and all. And there are a lot of other problems, conflicts are happening because of shortage of water in the summer season. So our animals are coming out of the forest and are getting to the conflict. This is, we can relate into the climate change also. So what we are trying to do that here, uh, we are trying to get the crops, agriculture crops, which is doesn't require more water in the area where people are living around the forest. This is a small strategy. Or coming to the sea turtle, for example, I'm talking about the overheating of the beaches that will not that is not good for the gender. So here, what we found recently, one is that temperature increasing the ambient temperature. Second is the microplastic which is present on the beaches. Now, plastic which is present on the beaches where the turtle eggs are laid, when the sunlight falls on the, uh, that soil, it is first to actually heat the plastic. That increases the more temperature. Now the thing is, we cannot do something with the sunlight, which is, uh, it will take time because it is a global phenomenon. We have to do a lot of forestation. We have to do a lot of plantation, bring down the temperature, bring down the carbon, all those things are there. But immediately what we can do is we can remove the plastic. That's what the government strategy now. Okay, now we minimize the plastic pollution. So like that, it is not a single solution, but it are solution. Strategy plans are already developed by the global community. We, you know, you must have heard about the IPCC. So this is the, the main job is to actually come up with a mitigation plan. We have a mitigation too. Uh, government is actually adopting. You know, the government of India promoting more on the solar power energy. We're not going coal mining. Okay, there are a lot of things that we are is the global temperature. Coming to Aditya Mohapatra questions that uh, there are so many institutions. It, this is not the one that will work on it. Many organizations in the country working on it. The main custodian of the wildlife conservation or biodiversity conservation of our country is the State Forest Department. And then the Ministry of Environment Forest, Government of India. These are the two main stakeholder agency. And uh, they have to take responsibility, provided the community support them. Because conservation means for community welfare only. So the community should support these two government and said, then we are the technical body. Your university also, uh, your university or my institution, we are technical body. We can technically help the state government, forest department, how to mitigate it. So then you are telling that whether it's a thing, uh, whatever happening is good or bad. Uh, I have a lot of hope you should also have positive. Uh, imagine the population, 1.4 billion people. Still, we have a wonderful wildlife in the country. And uh, this is not possible in other parts of the world, I'm telling you. It is only happening in India. With the, such a huge number of people, huge, in, and the majority of them are not uh, really good people, good in sense, not uh, rich people. We are poor people. Uh, middle class are very dominating in our Indian society and very poor people also living in our society. But still we are able to conserve whatever species which occur. Uh, it's something appreciatable. We should appreciate the Indian tradition in this. But still, yes, we have to do a lot. Uh, government, everybody is positive. I think the lot of awareness among the society, everybody in positive. And uh, whatever is happening, uh, some places may not be good, but some place we should appreciate a lot of good thing. I told you some of the good example, how uh, government is working on it. So we should work with the government. Uh, it is not the job of only government also. The community also should come take part and responsible to conserve the wildlife. Okay, I'll go for another question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Lots of questions, sir. Students have posted. Uh, let me take another question, sir. Uh, it is asked by Aditya Mohapatra. There are so many actions taken by the government and other organization for conservation of wildlife in India. Still, the depletion of wildlife is happening. 
so are the way of conservation process taken so far is is enough for their conservation and we should keep doing all such practices in the forest areas totally closed sir like what are the impact of all the like he was asking that are they effective or not sir because still there are a lot of endangered species or they are in urge of uh, extinction sir so yeah so if it another is totally another conserved or not another good question actually you are correct you are young blood and you are asking that the thing is uh, uh, yes we have to do a lot i i understand many species are declining in a faster rate in our country the reason is uh, uh, population growth human population growth uh, very fast growth is happening so when you increase the population naturally we have to feed these people then we have to increase the production of the agriculture and a plus we have to develop other uh, logistic uh, requirement to promote agriculture also so where they will go they will actually touch the natural resources that's the reason but coming back to your closed forest some majority as i said told you 20 percentage of forest are closed right now we can't close further because people also don't like to close forest actually because many people want uh, access to their natural resources so we have to look into the community also no uh, we can't simply uh, declare some uh, all the area as a protected area we shouldn't do that because protected area means uh, people are not allowed to take any resources then what will happen to those poor people it is a very uh, dangerous things when you close all the forest habitat but government doing it out of 20 percentage of forest cover about 5 percentage of area we declared already declared as a protected area that itself now many development sectors are eyeing on it they want to open those protected area which government of india not allowing in fact wildlife institute of india also not in favor of opening up the protected area right now because we could protect only 5 percentage of 20 percentage of the forest cover right now i understood this question is very challenging very very challenge to close the more forest habitats in our country uh, next question Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, it was asked by Anand, uh, sir, is there any alternate for the use of antibiotics, growth hormones used in the farm-fed chicken to increase its weight rapidly? I don't know why this asked question. Let me ask you another question, sir. Uh, okay. Sir, there is still a tribal people who are untouched, living in Andaman and Nicobar Island. They depend fully on the forest animals and the plants for their survival. so what are the measures to protect the endangered species of plants and animal in such phenomenon like uh, he's asking fact, about tribal communities that one in yes, ecosystem uh, islands uh, good actually i've been working in last uh, i started my research as i told you i started my research in 94 in nicobar island by that time you may not even born actually so since then i'm working in andaman nicobar islands uh, last uh, almost 26 27 years uh, what we found that Uh, the indigenous community they are very happy and they know how to do a sustainable use of resources only we that so called uh, cultured people na no? we climb ourselves we are very cultured but we are the guys we don't know how to actually uh, treat nature properly and uh, we don't know how to use the resource sustainably but tribal knows and they have been doing good and they will do good actually provided we don't touch them properly but then then another argument comes that how long we can keep the indigenous people as indigenous people we should bring them into mainstream so this is another challenging task whether we should bring them into mainstream yes we have been doing it right now most of the indigenous community in andaman nicobar bought into mainstream except to one group who still live in an island called a sentinel they are called a sentinels and they still no we don't know how they are sustaining there for long time so the island is very smaller in size they are living there they are using it but i'm sure that based on my experience indigenous community not at all threat to any wild life whether it's a plant or animal only what we did it we introduced a, some animal in andaman nicobar like a cheetah elephant they are destroying the indigenous plant endemic plants and the endemic animals of andaman nicobar not the indigenous community yes So very interesting question is asked by our student Kojhania. Uh, as you said that wildlife is important as well as development. 
so the question is here in arunachal pradesh a dibang hydro project is to be launched and more than 2.7 lakh trees are going to be felled and many animals will be homeless so what measures can we take as a student to prevent happening of uh, this loss in diversity sir excellent That's to protect this diversity of this valley it's a very burning issue i uh, really i am very happy that uh, your students are aware of this kind of issues it's a really good uh, youngsters should come forward to do uh, this thing but the thing is dibang valley and there are many uh, many many subang street dibang i myself worked in that area and i'm also part of that team who did a, a impact assessment not in dibang in uh, upper dibang i can say subang street and all the thing is uh, as i told you already it's a burning issue uh, our not a government need electricity because one of the poorest state in our country they don't have much other revenue resources or not a pradesh you know now they largely depend on the hydro project so that they can get some money so that they can improve the livelihood of the people of anna this is the one angle they do that now among the all the electric generating we need electricity in the country all of you know we are now talking each other in the covid condition only technology helping is the technology because of the electricity assuming there is no power in our area or my area we can't talk so we need power so we need a power and the anachal government will need a money and where they will get they find out the hydro project is one of the eco friendly energy generating project no doubt about that considering the gold mining that a thermal power station nuclear power station hydro power actually slightly environmental friendly but still it has issue like now if you throw small stone on a pond it has its negative impact on the pond water it may kill several plankton in it now the thing is how many planktons can be killed by one stone whether we throw small stone or a bigger stone if we throw bigger stone more planktons will destroy throw small stone less plankton will be destroyed this is what scientific community like as we do that we know entire himalaya having hydro project potential but we don't allow entire himalaya all the hydro projects to come up i'm talking about arunachal pradesh itself i did my two studies in arunachal pradesh one at the italian hydro italian region there is a one hydro projects going to be come means a plan to come it's under the clearance the one more project in the tawang valley where the black necked stork is living there so we did a study wildlife institute of india in a tawang valley we categorically rejected we said that if this hydro project comes there is no mitigation for uh, conserving the uh, black necked stork there so we recommended the government to scrap the project whereas in italy we found that italian one may go provided there may be some possibility of mitigation there we are not ruling out that italy won't affect the biodiversity it will affect definitely any hydro project anywhere in the world will affect but now we have to see where we'll have the project if we can't have a project in italy where else we'll have it similarly tibang i'm not directly related to this particular hydro project i heard lot about this project because myself work on the river system that's a issue and uh, we have to compromise somewhere that's what i'm telling you some balance something will be affected means we have to find out the mitigation for that if there is a mitigation plan we can go ahead if there is no mitigation we should scrap that development plan that is what idea but i can't talk more further in this regard it's sensitive yes sir yes sir i understand sir i understand yeah. it's a property issues but sir i'm very grateful sir you are elaborating the explanation more very uh, very descriptive way sir uh, I have a question, sir. Can I ask some more questions, sir? Yes, sir. Just yes, one in the five minutes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Question, no problem. Sir. Okay. Sir, uh, question asked by Jenny. Jenny Chanu. She is my student also. Uh, are our endangered species safe in current situation in India? What is the status of protection given to them to the local people, sir? okay again good question injured species uh, yeah please sir what government is taking sir okay first answer is not safe 
<laughs> our endangered species, that's why it's called endangered. Uh, if, if this species safe means they are not endangered. Uh, yes, okay. Sir. okay, it's endangered. Uh, not many species are safe in our country. Not uh, like a tiger. Tiger is so lucky. Tiger is very safe in our country. Uh, rhino is safe in our country. Elephant is safe in our country. But not many other endangered species. Only the flagship species are safe in our country. There are many more species which are endangered, but they are not flagship. Many people not even aware of those species. They are not doing very well. Okay, that's one thing there. Now, one thing government of India did is many, almost all endangered animal species which occurs in our country, they put it in the Wildlife Protection Act. So legally they are protected. Nobody allowed to kill this animal legally. But people go for poaching. Okay, illegal activities are happening there. So uh, keep in brief, our endangered species are not safe, except few. Sir, this Shantala Rakesh here is asking that uh, he in the uh, he is from the forest area of Nallamala Forest. If I'm saying right, sir. Uh, this government has allotted crores of money, but they are not associated with the local people. So why the government is not allowing local people to be a part of such huge projects, sir? Because they are directly or indirectly associated with uh, this project, sir. Okay. Uh, the, I can give my opinion only because I'm not, I don't know much about detail about this project. Any program we do, we have to identify the stakeholders. Anything, anything we do it, even someone coming and taking photo of me, they should get uh, permission from me because I'm the stakeholder. They're taking photo of me. So similarly, if I take photo on you, I should get permission from you. This is what. So one has to identify the stakeholders and then they should be consulted for everything. If the local communities are not consulted, without their idea something happening in their area, it is not acceptable. That is my opinion. I don't know exactly what is this program or what is happening there, but if they are not involved the community means it's very bad. We don't subscribe such a thing. Yes. Uh, Krishna Kumari uh, uh, asking uh, how the climate change is affecting the river escapes. In fact, uh, see that uh, again, uh, as I told you, I'm being a river biologist. What I know, most of the one group of people, like uh, people coming from the Indian Institute of Technology, hydrological engineers, hydro project people, what they think that uh, water is the medium, chemical medium, it has the energy. When it flows through the gradient, uh, why don't you use that uh, gradient energy to generate electricity? That's what the electric people, electric engineer people think in that. Agriculture people like you people, some of you from agriculture science, you may think that, hey, this water is going and wasting in a meeting in the sea, getting wasted. Why don't you divert, dam it, and then use it for irrigation, agriculture purpose. So everybody uh, uh, thinks the water river is a different aspect. But I think... I see river as a life, as a habitat of wildlife, animals living there. For them, it is a home. Okay, we should take care of them. That's what we think in that. But as per the climate change concern, all freshwater ecosystem, again, it's a, another most vulnerable habitat due to the climate change. You can just Google it. Even IPCC brought out a separate guidelines for wetland management with respect to climate change. Myself involved in developing a guideline, mitigation plan for wetlands with the Ramsar. You can just Google it, visit the ramsar.org website, where you can get a n number of document talking about how wetlands are vulnerable to climate change. Is one of them. It's not only the wetland itself, because wetland get affected means there are a lot of people will be affected. It is not like a forest ecosystem. Forest ecosystem uh, you can easily simply say the people, okay, you get out of this forest, if the forest is closed or something like that, we can we can provide other alternative. Ability. But if the people who are living along the wetland are directly re related. Uh, water is something which is very important for us, actually. Okay, for our drinking purpose, for uh, irrigation, for everything, water, fresh water is very important. So something goes wrong with the fresh water ecosystem, that means something will happen to human being also. That's why the global community more concerned about the wetland and the rivers are most vulnerable 
and uh, the way we dealing with a wetland reverse ecosystem nowadays because of the dam it is very surprising I, i agree with our previous student also asked this question uh, we blindly going for hydro project almost all the rivers there is not even a single major river in the country without a dam section it's not good for long term survival of the rivers but the problem here is we need electricity we need economic improvement what kind of uh, alternative so we are going for a mitigation so now we come up with a new concept called a minimum environmental flow when you bring the dam when you construct a dam we recommend that that dam authority should release at least this much of water continuously in the downstream that is a mitigation plan this is a new concept now we introduced so we have been practicing in the last 7 8 years in the country so that's what including your arunachal all the hydro project we recommended the minimum environmental flow so the project people are not willing to release the water we said if you don't release it no project so but again i agree with you rivers are one of the other most vulnerable habitat for climate change yes next question i'm i not audible can you hear me yeah audible sir yes 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 uh, sir the last question is uh, it's a leopard project how much amount of uh, and what kind of work uh, your organization is doing regarding the afforestation and roof forestation sir reforestation sir leopard project okay leopard project okay good very good <laughs> that's is interesting uh leopard is another important animal we are losing very fast rate right? but we don't give weightage much uh, like not like a tiger a tiger because it gets political attention a lot of people know about tiger so they everybody talks about a tiger but the same national tiger conservation authority uh, equally give attention to leopard also we know because uh, many large number of leopards are getting killed by poachers in the recent past lot of leopard skins are seized in the airport and ship wherever route international route so the government is really worried about the way the poachers are killing our leopard that's one thing there in another way leopards also one of the important animal which get into human wildlife conflict many people also killed by leopard in the area where the forest ecosystems are degraded by the purpose so leopard lives everywhere leopard actually can live in the near human habitation also it can survive in the sugarcane field also so so the conflict issues are also there uh, as per the forestation concern i am not having much knowledge about uh, forestation all those things what we know that we are trying to uh, bring a uh, asking the people uh, manage the forest ecosystem and protect the forest ecosystem properly where our leopards are living and make sure that leopards are not getting into the human habitation and leave the leopard live is happily in their own habitat don't allow the leopard coming to the human habitation when they come into the human habitation like a sugarcane field we go to the pune you can get into such problem even himalaya uttarakhand himachal pradesh and all we have a lot of leopard conflict that people are getting killed by leopard that is because they lose the predator the prey species leopard need a lot of food the food is not available in the natural forest system because again degraded by the human being in that area so the leopard comes to the human habitation to steal the goat or a cattle then if they don't find anything they find the women or children they kill them that cut things are there but leopard is very important species wildlife institute of india are doing a lot of research on uh, leopard also but not many as like a tiger because compared to tiger leopard really uh, loses its uh, uh, not a value priority i can say but there are many organizations working on leopard it's not that leopards are ignored and the people understand but i i, I agree with you that leopard need lot of attention also. thank you So, sir, I think uh, it's lot of discussion, sir. Elaborate discussion we had when variety of uh, questions put up by the participants, and I'm equally thankful to the participant as well that uh, they put up such an interesting and relevant questions to the speakers. And sir, I'm very very thankful to you, sir. On the in the last day, 
uh, it's a very very elaborated and well covered uh, presentations you have shown to us thank you so much sir i also learned a lot of things uh, what wildlife india institute contributing recently because i was there in dehradun sir last 2016 sir i left 2016 i joined here sir i visited very various times sir wi institute and uh, i thankful that still the organization is uh, associated with pioneer work and uh, i'm wishing you all the best sir in your thank work as well sir and thank you so much for this very wonderful presentation sir thank, thank you, you very so much sir. Sir, just a minute the... sir uh, you just So keep with us for another five minutes. Okay. Sir, we have okay. 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 Sure. Sure. All the participants who unmute their cameras and uh, be with us for another five minutes, sir. We'll take the record of uh, the participants. You can also see our students, sir, by this okay. way. I request okay. a participant to please put on their cameras. All the participants. All the participants requested to please put put on their cameras. So you can uh, uh, switch to gallery view, sir, so that you can see all the. Yes, sir, I'm seeing there. that. I'm seeing the nice to see you people. Very nice. <laughs> Next time when I come to Arunachal, I'll visit uh, your university yeah. also. No, sir. Most welcome, sir. Yeah, yeah. Very fortunate, sir. If you visit yeah, Institute yeah. Sir, College, sir. Sure, sure. sure. I sir, I think yes, sir, just a minute, sir. So we are witnessing around 102 participants right now, sure. and uh, on behalf of organizing committee, College of Horticulture, and the NAI program, I would like to thanks to each and every person. who have been involved with the uh, directly in this webinar and making it as a successful webinar and uh, i really thankful to the our organizers uh, co organizers as well as uh, all the members for helping me tonight for this uh, arranging this webinar it's very not that easy to so online also we are so dependent on internet connectivity being so far from the mainland still we managed and uh, i'm thankful i'm thankful to each and every person for their support thank you sir uh, i i think i i request i request all the participants at least be here for another 2 minutes for some more formal discussion and thank you sir thank you so much okay thank you <laughs> thank you very much okay then all the best thank you sir thank you sir thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is a final announcement regarding your uh, webinar. It's ended now quite well. Thank you so much, all the participants. Am I audible? Yes, okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, all the participants. So those, okay, those who have left uh, uh, attending the uh, any feedback link or some reasons because of internet connectivity, please mail me personally in my email ID. I will respond. And uh, I will give you the final feedback link today, and a couple of time you will receive. And the link will remain open at the three to four hours. Please send your reply, okay? And tomorrow at the same time, around two thirty, we will conduct the quiz. Forty questions you will get. Forty questions you will get for forty one minute for each quiz. And those who qualify immediately, you will get your certificate. Uh, uh, certificate. Those who qualify automatically will get your certificate in your email ID. So the uh, minimum percent of my passing is thirty percent. So all the best for your exam for tomorrow. And uh, all the details of uh, YouTube links, everything is already in your email. So go to revise it and uh, try to give answers. And it will be not that difficult, I hope. And all the best tomorrow at two thirty. We'll get back again, and I will start the. I will share the link in your email IDs. Exactly at two thirty, I will share the link. 
So you will get 40 questions, one in each question, 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, it will disable. As per result, you will get this edit. If you have any queries regarding any issue or if you want to want some PPT, what the speaker shared with us, and definitely share. Constance has have shared his uh, publications and PPT that I will share with you. And uh, other things, if you require their email IDs or anything, you let us know. My email ID is with you all. You can ask me any queries anytime. And uh, all the best for tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye. Gold, Thank you.